one thing that I think is true is that I believe fine art is losing some of its prestige now. It used to be sort of that area in our culture where we enshrined our highest ideals. We don't agree anymore on what our highest ideals are, and therefore it's difficult to sort of justify enshrining certain things. Welcome to Purpose Soul Lab, a Maja Center podcast. I'm Katherine Hadro with my co-host, Dr. Daniel Keebler. And as we're delving into human flourishing, we're going to discuss art, which is really only appropriate for this theme. Yeah, we're going to talk humans and what makes us unique. You know, art and, and is, is one of those things, culture, art. So it's interesting to, to, to look at why do humans do art and what does it reveal about us? Mm-hmm. And can we flourish through art too right. and creating art? Yeah. Um, Leading us through this conversation, this topic is Dr. Katie Kresser. She's a professor of art history at Seattle Pacific University. She'll be joining us via Zoom from Seattle, Washington. Originally from Indiana, Katie earned her undergraduate degree from Indiana University and her graduate degrees from Harvard University. She's the author of two books, several scholarly essays, and has curated numerous exhibitions. If you read the Maja Center website, you might recognize her name. She does a number of articles there. Uh, And with that, let's kick it off with our interview with Dr. Katie Kresser. Katie, thank you so much for joining us from Seattle. I really appreciate speaking with you. Just to get us started, can you tell us about um, the beginning of your interest in art history? Ah, yes. The beginning of my interest in art history. Well, I think I'm a rare person who was obsessed with art history from a relatively young age. Um, My dad um, was a high school art teacher. He's now retired. And I grew up in a house full of art books and also my dad's old art history textbooks. Um, And I think, you know, he hadn't been super enthusiastic about those big old musty books with a lot of black and white photographs in them. But I poured over them as a child. Um, I think certain aspects of them I had probably memorized by the time I was in middle school. And then when I got into high school, anytime I had a chance to do to exercise creativity in a project or something, I always brought art history into it. So it was an obsession for me from a young age, and I never really thought I'd be able to do it professionally, but I feel so blessed that I actually am. So I I thank God for that. And we're benefiting from that as well. And just to set a framework for the rest of our conversation How do you, as an art historian, define art? Ah, excellent question. This is going to get back to my book a little bit. Actually, it will probably be um, something we'll be talking about in a few minutes. But I think art is notoriously difficult to define. Um, uh, One, for example, um, the, the artwork considered the most influential in the 20th century, according to a panel of experts, is um, a quote, sculpture by Marcel Duchamp that is actually a urinal. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. It's quite notorious. But um, it's a urinal he bought from an appliance store um, that he took and placed on a pedestal in an art gallery, and he called it art. Um, And this generated decades of debate. He did this in the second decade of the 20th century. And so um, today, I think ever since that episode, um, people in the fine arts have been debating what is art? Is art created only by its context? That is, if you can successfully put something on a pedestal in a gallery or museum, um, does that make it art? If someone recognized as a great artist calls something art, does that make it art? Or is there something absolute and intrinsic about an object that makes it art? And I think that was that's the question Marcel Duchamp was asking. I come down on the side that there is something intrinsic um, to an object that makes it art, um, and I. But it's hard to define. But as we as we will see, probably if if we discuss the book and other things later, um, I think that art is something created purposefully by a human being to create a window onto the transcendent, um, onto the good, the true, the beautiful, the divine. Um, and I think it is something that didn't really emerge into the world in that form until the early Christian centuries. Um, I actually think art is a is a Christian phenomenon. I think it was made possible by the um, emergence of the Christian religion. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So uh, maybe we can sort of pick up with that theme and sort of look at sort of historically what um, sort of the, the emergence of drawing, painting, sculpting, um, you know, sort of in pre-Christian times, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there's art in, in caves dating back to 40,000 years ago. Um, and uh 
um, or, and then you have this pre-Christian, you know, the, the sort of the Greek art. Um, what um, what do you see in that that uh, you know that that points to the transcendent, or does it not? Do you think in that in that yeah, period? Per- great question. Um, so one thing that's interesting when linguists or historians look at the historical record, they notice that cultures outside of kind of Western Europe, the Mediterranean, um, uh, prior to um, sort of the new millennium. Uh, prior to the in the coming of Christ, uh, didn't really have a word for art. Instead, um, many of the objects that we call art and that we use to populate our art museums were made for other purposes. Um, and somehow, someone at some point decided that they all shared something in common and that they should be brought together in one space and called art. So, for example, if we look at cave paintings, um, Those objects, I think, were not made um, with the same intention um, that people make framed paintings to hang in galleries. Oftentimes, cave paintings were made for, we believe, very ceremonial purposes, where maybe the process of making the painting was just as important as the product. Um, This may explain why some cave paintings are deep in caves and very dark areas where it's not really optimal viewing conditions. So they, they may have been part of some kind of religious ritual. Um, This is true of a lot of other visual type, visual cultural objects from the ancient world is that their their primary purpose was not to be sequestered in something that we might call an art museum or an art gallery. They very often had very specific kind of utilitarian purposes, but often utilitarian in the sense that they were supposed to be used in a liturgical or magical sort of way. Um, So as for those ancient objects, I would say many of them are beautiful and many of them share characteristics with what we today think of as art, but um, their makers did not really intend for them to be art in the way we think of it. And our imposition of an artistic sort of lens or filter onto them is a little bit of like a, a modern projection. Yeah, yeah. So you point out that they they might have been used for some type of religious ritual. So you know, what's the the connection you see there between art and and, and faith? Or, you know, in in that sense. Yeah. So I think that the big turning point is that, um, yeah, in Christianity and in Judaism before it, of course, God is transcendent. Um, you cannot manipulate God. You cannot hold God in a container. Um, you cannot uh, tie God down to a place. Um, And so a lot of the art of the ancient world, I think, came from a genuine human longing to sort of contact the divine, to negotiate with the divine, and in many cases, perhaps control the divine or hold it or keep it. Um, And that this is where we get, you know, the types of idols that were prohibited in the Old Testament, the New Testament as well, idols that are complained about in the Bible that are meant to have have some sort of his... um, magical function that's kind of keeping, holding, or locating the divine or trying to control the divine in some way. And so a a lot of the ancient objects that we look at today that were used for religious purposes, liturgical, magical purposes, often had that sort of magical element to them where they weren't really being used as a window onto something transcendent because there perhaps wasn't a very clear idea of the transcendent. Um, in a lot of those cultures, especially at the popular level, but instead they were used as some kind of maybe magical container um, where where God was got a god or or the divine as as it was understood could be controlled. So um, more of a logical sort of magical um, inflection there, um, something that we might today call idolatry. Um, but when we move into the Christian tradition, we see this widespread recognition that God is indeed transcendent, that he can't be held, captured in a single place. Um, that what, I don't know, a lot of the practices that we um, think of as magical, that they kind of didn't function um, in the way we thought because now we have a new understanding of God. And therefore, art becomes, instead of an idol, instead of a sort of container of the divine, it becomes a, a more humble sort of window onto the divine and this actually uh, kicks in motion a lot of creativity, somewhat paradoxically. Um, as these religious objects become humbler, they also there's also much more room for innovation and experimentation. Can you expand on that and how it is that the incarnation, why and how the incarnation changed the way we view art? Yeah, I think it's, I imagine um, it was so mind-blowing for a lot of people in the early centuries. Obviously, we look at all these debates about heresies in the early centuries, and we can see how difficult it must have been for people to get their minds around this idea that God became a man 
right? Um, I, I think there are kind of two ways um, that the incarnation ushered in what we think of as art. Um, one of them is that it sort of proved, it demonstrated that there was something about matter, physicality, the human form that could um, be sort of assumed by God, that, that, could, that could properly evoke God, that could reflect God, that could in a way embody God um, without like distortion. Like um, if we look at the way gods were often pictured in ancient cultures, maybe they're sort of chimerical creatures made up of different parts of animals, or maybe they're extremely large, or maybe they are um, brightly colored or um, just um, unbelievably supernaturally beautiful or something like that. But um, when God, when Christ was incarnate, he showed that an ordinary human being could, could properly evoke God, could be the very word of God, could actually sort of demonstrate God to the world. And this um, was extremely ennobling, I think, to matter, to the physical and to the human form in particular. And so um, just aspects of nature that I think before might have been overlooked, might have been considered per per too humble to mess with in certain ways, are now suddenly elevated to things that can become you know, authentically evocative of God. And there's an Im impetus there to take a second look at them in a way and to celebrate them, adorn them, present them through beautiful objects in a way maybe they had never been presented before. So so we do get, I think, a new attention to the human form as in the image of God. Um, secondly, I think the idea of the incarnation, um, not only did it say that the human form itself was able to evoke God, but it, it indicated that the human mind and the way humans act and behave in the world also could evoke God. And so human creativity, for example, is not um, a mere sort of mechanical process that you can sort of boss around, maybe. Um, it's it's something that's actually implanted by God and may reflect the creativity of God. And so there's a new honor for and respect for human creativity and innovation and all of the things that that can produce. And so I kind of think those two things together, that respect for the human form and the forms for nature, and also respect for human creativity and the human mind through the incarnation resulted in just this explosion of creativity and this whole tradition of art as we appreciate it today. You already mentioned how art points to the transcendent, but here you're saying how now the human person, now nature points to the transcendent as well. Yeah, that's right. And it's so paradoxical. Um, there was the big deal, this iconoclastic controversy in some of the early Christian centuries where there are these debates about to what extent can matter reflect the divine and um, uh, John of Damascus is actually famous for insisting that um, matter as created by God is good and purposeful and beautiful, and that God intended for it to communicate him to us in all of its little aspects. Um, yeah, and this this led to tremendous appreciation for the beauty of nature and tremendous artistic creativity. Yeah, well, that's great. I, I, I like how you talk about the, you know, the creative aspect of art reflects uh, the creative aspect of God in there. So looking at, you know, this um, sort of Christian art or art after the incarnation, is there a period where you say, well, this is where that was done um, best? Like it really embodies the, you know, what you're talking about, this um, uh, the uplifting of nature and the human person to be trans a, a window into God. Where, where do you see that being done the best or, or, or in that time? That is such an excellent question. And I, I get that question a lot. Um, I think we as human beings, we want to be able to point to the best and we want to be able to identify something reliable that is the best. And um, at the same time, I think we human beings get desensitized to things because of familiarity. Um, and so for a while, we can think something's the best and be, you know, all about it and gaga over it. And then we get tired of it and we don't appreciate it anymore. So um, and this is something that art critics have noticed over the centuries. Um, to try to answer your question a little more directly, um, it's a trite answer, but I actually do think there are things about the Renaissance that make it almost kind of unparalleled in the history of human art, human art making. Um uh, you know, it's artworks from the Renaissance are some of the most famous in the world worldwide. Sistine Chapel ceiling, the Mona Lisa, stuff like that, both hailing from the same decade at the beginning of the 1500s. 
Um, and so, yeah, like I said, it's a trite answer, but um, I, I think that period right there, late 1400s, early 1500s in Italy had this really nice combination of widespread development of artistic skill, um, fairly profound understanding of theology on the part of practicing artists. Um, also, you had a public at the time that was very appreciative of art and very encouraging of artists. And um, art was popular and, um, yeah, artists were kind of well supported and well funded during that time. There was a tendency toward kind of friendly art competitions where artists were pushing each other to be better. Um, and all these things together resulted, I think, in a moment when um, there was just a lot of beautiful stuff being created at like a, a very peak of excellence. Um, and yeah, so just a, a, a nice historical moment where a lot of things came together to help art forms kind of develop to their peak. That having been said, I I, I think um, no, yeah, you, art forms can't stay um, in stasis. They they can't remain the same forever. Ever. Even if you've reached a peak, you can't just stay there again because the human sensorium, you know, our minds, our senses, we get desensitized and we can't appreciate the excellent if we're too saturated with it. So we have to pivot and we have to try other things. And so um, there are other eras of art completely different from the Renaissance that are also very beautiful and moving and touch us in ways that Renaissance art can't. Um, I'm a big fan of Rembrandt, for example, who is actually working in a Protestant milieu, though he himself is privately Catholic. His painting style is really different than, say, Michelangelo's. And I'm also kind of partial to some of the post-impressionists working in the last decade um, of the 19th century, the 1800s. Some of the work they produced, I think, is also really profound. Van Gogh would be a famous example. So you can look, I don't know, all over the place. You can find examples of people hitting a peak and doing something really excellent. Um, but yeah, again, culture can't stay there. It has to keep moving so that we can keep... Um, rediscovering and keep having our eyes opened and not get desensitized by things that we come to feel are trite. So, Well, that being said, from the peak and the golden era of art, as you were describing, can you talk us through um, art history when it comes to the late 19th and early 20th century? Right. And that that's a time, I think, for people who follow art history, for art lovers, I think that can be a time uh, that's challenging. What we have with the rise of abstraction in the early 20th century is, I think, something born of a lot of different cultural factors all at once. Um, one big thing that is happening is that in Europe in particular, um, Europe has just gone through a century of revolutions just in many cases, successive violent revolutions kind of rippling throughout the continent. Um, we have monarchies falling. We have the establishment of democracies. So um, all this kind of government instability. Um, we have, uh, in many cases, a suppression of traditional religion um, and sometimes persecution of um, priests and um practitioners and leaders in, in traditional re religion, Catholicism in particular. Um, but the result for creative people is that there's just massive instability, that nothing, nothing is certain anymore, um, and that the old visual vocabulary, the old symbols, um, the old, you know, I don't know, the old lexicon of just, you know, how you express yourself visually, um, how you make sense of the world visually it it seemed outdated or at the very least um, just no longer sort of relevant to the really turbulent, violent modern condition and also a modern condition that's starting to d dabble with um, a completely different worldview that's verging toward the atheistic Um uh, and so, yeah, a lot of artists, a lot of um, modern art, abstract art is an attempt to try to create a new visual vocabulary that can speak into a turbulent sort of agnostic world in which nothing can be taken for granted and in which all the old sort of vocabularies and traditions no longer seem to make sense. And so there's a little bit of a bleakness there that I think a lot of people feel when they see abstract art. But these artists are sincerely grappling with a way to express their experiences. Um, also, at the same time, we have um, um, indigenous art, um, trickling into places like Europe and America due to colonialism, and it's influencing artists as well. Pablo Picasso owned a number of African masks, 
And um, the, the forms of those masks, especially kind of the simplest, most abstract ones, were inspiring to him. Um, and then we, too, as well, I think we have license among a lot of abstract artists to turn inward and, um, again, kind of going with what I said earlier, in a world where everything is falling apart, where you don't know where the true authority lies anymore, you don't have a stable account of culture and how the universe works anymore, you lean on subjectivity, you turn inward and you investigate your own emotions. And I think a lot of abstract art is very intentional, inward looking, some people might call navel gazing, attempt to sort of represent one's emotions in um, a highly, highly highly personal way that doesn't have to make use of maybe some cultural symbols and cultural baggage that you don't agree with anymore. So I think there are a lot of historical and philosophical reasons why um, certain people wouldn't resonate with abstract art, but it, it, I think we can kind of see why it emerged when it emerged. Yeah, it's interesting how you know both the, you're talking about Renaissance art and, and then art at the turn of the 20th century, how it's really embedded in the culture and, and it flows out of the questions that uh, the theology, the history, what's going on in, in society and whether, you know, f- and that influences what it's looking at and what it's, uh, which is, which, which I, I think is, you know, um, uh, interesting. Do, do you see um, like in modern, like it, it is the current art 20, late 20th century, early 21st century, what, what's the direction you see the culture's m- moving art now? Yeah, good question. Yeah, I feel like for me, um, the 20th century that we just have emerged from, although I know it's been a while since we emerged from it, um, was a kind of a period of deconstruction of sort of philosophically questioning what is art, you know, what is truth, um, often in a very angsty kind of way. Um, And I think uh, moving into the 21st century, um, I, I think what I see is I don't know. It feels like a free for all. Um, <laughs> uh, I I think one thing that I think is true is that I believe fine art is losing some of its prestige now mm-hmm. um, because it used to be um, sort of that area in our culture where we enshrined our highest ideals. Um, like art museums are supposed to enshrine our highest ideals in visual form in a certain way. And I think we've reached a point in post-modernity when we all kind of realize that we don't agree anymore on what our highest ideals are. And therefore, it's difficult to sort of justify enshrining certain things because we're not even sure if we trust them anymore. And we don't really know why we selected them in the first place, you know. And so some of that prestige of like fine art as like the sort of summary of what our culture is all about, that it's loftiest products. I don't think people believe that anymore, actually. Um, so I think that the art world is is declining in prestige, that as a result, it's kind of becoming more open to just anyone. It's taking itself less seriously. You know, this isn't true in all quarters, but it's true in a lot of them, I think. Um, so there's much less homogeneity and there's much less kind of super seriousness about it, more playfulness. Um, which is good, I think. It also feels a little chaotic, and it's not clear where the art world is going. Um, but I was thinking an art form that I feel is maybe very characteristic of our 21st century is the immerse- is immersive installation art. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever been like in- gone into an art installation before and just been surrounded by maybe weird stuff that's all over the ceilings and floor. And I'm seeing some nods. I don't know. Do you guys... Yeah, yeah, that'll pop up in Washington D.C. I think there was a museum not long ago. It had like um, pits of just different bouncy balls that people can oh, come yeah. immerse mm-hmm. themselves into. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's like about creating a total experience. And um, I, I actually was thinking to myself last night that a lot of the immersive installation art that we see coming out today almost has its origins in something like Disneyland or something, which is trying to create immersive environments in sort of a playful way. Um, But I think also in a postmodern environment where we don't have agreed upon ideals anymore, um, the immersive installation kind of just lets you, especially in more fine art spaces, um, immerse yourself in someone else's subjectivity for a minute. So I feel like a lot of um, immersive installation art is the artist just saying, this is what's in my brain you know, all the weird stuff exploding in my head, you know, all my memories, you know, all my triggers, all my issues, all the things I love. 
I'm going to just put them out there in this space and then let you walk into it. So it's it's very hyper individualistic, actually. It's kind of letting the artist swallow you up with their subjectivity in a certain way. Um, but it also is kind of taking itself less seriously and is a bit more playful than the art we saw um, a, like a generation back. So I don't know. Um, I, I don't know where the art world is going, but I feel like a lot of its structures are sort of falling apart and we're, we're seeing something new emerge and, you know, we'll just have to see what happens. Well, that I mean, that was fascinating to even hear you reflect on our present day and what our art is reflecting of our present time. But just to follow up on that, would you say bad art is still considered art? Oh, is bad art still considered art? What a good question. Um, you know, um, I I think I do I think I do think bad art is still considered art. Um I I think if an object is made with the intention to evoke something beyond, um, evoke something profound, evoke something spiritual. Um and communicate it. I, I think the ambition there to do that is an what we is an art, authentically artistic am, ambition, but it can be pulled off in a way that is unsuccessful or unpleasing. So sure, I think that I think there can be bad art. Um, honestly, this is a little bit um, like if we look at children's art, for example, you know, oftentimes it's not the most skillful, but in a way, I think that th- that ambition is there to express something large. Um, to express something kind of profound, fundamental, um, but but through a skill set that's not quite able to achieve achieve its goals quite yet. This might be a good opportunity, I think, to segue into your book, uh, Bezalel's Body, The Death of God and the Birth of Art. It's a provocative title. Our interest has definitely peaked. What are you conveying in this title and, and what is your book about? Yeah, good question. Again, I keep saying that. Um, all right. So, um, yeah, the death of God and the birth of art is meant to be a little bit of a shocking and eye-opening title. Um, I came to it kind of intuitively, actually, and then realized how Nietzschean it sounds. Um, actually, after I landed on it, I realized that. Um, but yeah, Nietzsche uh, talked about the death of God, and um, God is dead, and we have killed him. And he he's one of sort of the fundamental thinkers of, of, our, of a modern era of like sort of angsty sort of atheism where we have to create our own meaning because there is no God out there. There's no trans- transcendent order that that is providing the meaning for us. We have to create our own meaning. And um, uh also, an echo in my title is Nietzsche's Birth of Tragedy, which is a piece in which he kind of lays out this, how you know, how we use art, how we use aesthetics to create our own meaning and how that actually had its roots in ancient Greece. Um, so if you looked at the title kind of um, without, uh, you know, looking at the context the book came from, which is actually a, a theological press, you'd be like, hmm, you know, is this Nietzschean maybe? Um, is is this talking about how art um, after the modern death of God is is being used to create meaning and a void of meaning? Um, but yeah, that's not what it's about. Actually, the book is referring to the death of God um, as the, it, the death of God referred to there is the crucifixion of Jesus, the redemptive crucifixion of Jesus, followed by his resurrection. And the birth of art is kind of what we've been talking about already, which is this almost sort of a historical discovery of a new mode of human creativity that can function as a window onto the divine, not as an idol, but as something else, as something that's a humble window onto the divine. That, again, is made possible through this new understanding of the dignity of nature and the dignity of human creativity, just like we discussed a little bit earlier in the interview. So it actually um, traces this sort of birth of art as we know it, um, through the paradigm shift of the incarnation. And it's, I think, a very positive book in that sense, celebrating these centuries of human creativity and also pointing at how we can thank the Christian revelation for that, um, for all those centuries of creativity. Yeah. You, so you've talked about how um, the the Christian um, um, the story helps make art uh, transcendent, or, or gives it that transcendent quality. The, uh, uh, how does it um, you know, help us look at, you know, maybe you know, it can reveal God and, and point towards uh, the transcendence of things. But how does it help us, you know, see nature and see other individuals differently 
um, it, it, does it always have to point to, to God directly, like to be good art? But do, is there other aspects of art that um, you know could help us on a more um, secular plane? Let's say. You know? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, um, if God ennobled in a way all of creation or revealed the nobility of creation through the incarnation, then um, really an irreverent, respectful depiction of anything in nature, anything God created is congruent with the Christian revelation, is honoring of the Christian revelation, and is sort of adorning the Christian revelation. And um, I think a really notable thing, actually, people talk about how um, uh, Catholic clergy were instrumental in the development of modern science, right? And I think that um, Catholic artists um, were instrumental in the development of a lot of modern artistic technique for exactly the same reasons. Um, So if you go back to um, the year that we kind of often call the very beginning of the Renaissance, sometimes people put that at about 1300. Um, This is just a bit after Francis of Assisi, um, um, after... uh, yeah, the theology of Thomas Aquinas has been percolating through the world as well. And we we get what we get with early Renaissance artists who are being influenced by these things is um, this really sharp attention to nature that had never really been seen to that extent anywhere in the history of the world. Um, the, many people call the first um, Renaissance artist, say the first Renaissance artist was a fellow named Giotto who was working around Florence, Giotto di Bondone. And um, he was so celebrated and launched, um, uh, well, well, because he was so celebrated because of his eye for nature, um, because he was attentive, like he looked at the nature around him and he noticed its details and he rendered it sometimes with startling accuracy um, to the point that a lot of his early viewers, I I tell my students, almost felt like they were looking at virtual reality environments or something because of the level of realism that he had been able to conjure. Um, And it caused them to open their eyes to the great detail in nature and its complexity in ways that they hadn't realized before. I think if we look at Giotto now, he doesn't feel as realistic to our modern eyes as he did to people back in the early 14th century. But at the time, he really introduced something eye-opening and mind-blowing to people. And and it was because inheriting, I think, a culture that was um, more and more imbued with, sort of inflected by the teachings of some of the great um, Christian philosophers and theologians and saints over the centuries that talked that were ennobling nature and instructing us to look at nature because it was created by God. Well, he took all that and he brought that into an art form that caused everyone now to notice these really um, precious and interesting details about nature. And so we fast forward a couple of hundred years, we get to Leonardo da Vinci, and we uh, like, we look at pieces like his Mona Lisa and other pieces like his Madonna of the Rocks, um, and we see extraordinary scientific understanding of flora and fauna and geological formations and also human anatomy that are kind of tracking with what scientists were doing. Um, And I think all of that is possible because of how these Christian artists, just through their worldview, believed that nature was noble, created by God, reflecting kind of the structures of the mind of God, and therefore worth investigating, even in its very minutest particles. There seems to be a congruence there with the the way that the Catholic mindset or the Christian mindset sort of revolutionized science. At the same time, uh, it, it tracks with with the, the idea that no, uh, these physical things aren't gods. They they're they're transcendent. They reveal God. They're, they're the handiwork of God. Which it, 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 it's interesting how the that that fits with what you're saying about how art tracks with that yeah, Christian totally. understanding. Yeah, totally. I of the think world. they were totally hand in hand. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of Christian artists, we talked about kind of the state of art today. So if there's someone who's listening, a, a serious artist who is a Christian, what advice do you have for them? Yeah, what what a good question there. Um, I mentioned earlier how I feel like the art world is in some ways kind of falling apart. Um, I was going the first thing I would tell that person is unless you've like heard an unmistakable voice of God, you know, sort of promising you this, you know, I don't know. Don't try to make a living as an artist. I I um think it's it's a perilous field to try to like to make a living in. Um, 
Uh, very, very few people succeed in actually being able to pay their bills just by making art. Um, that wasn't always true in history, and maybe at some point in the future it won't be true anymore either. But it's hard right now in the world of fine art to actually make a living. A, a lot of um really big names actually they don't make a living by selling their art. They teach art and then they make art on the side. Mm. Um, so it's a difficult field to break into. Um, in addition, I feel like a lot of the structures that have developed around the art world, um, especially in the last um. 150, 200 years, but in some cases, even before, um, uh, are a little bit soul killing um, in the sense that um, a lot of times today, artistic practice is about creating your brand Mm -hmm. and then self-promoting. It's about creating a brand, sticking to that brand, and then relentlessly promoting yourself so that you can get people to buy your work and make yourself a celebrity and I feel like that that market pressure, which has existed in some places in the world since the 1600s, um, is kind of inimical to uh, the sort of contemplative pursuit of truth and beauty that you'd like to think art ideally would be. So um, I think for really sincere artists who are wanting to capture goodness, truth and beauty, they have to work very hard not to get sucked into all the sort of perverse incentives of the self-branding and self-promotion system. Um, So a a Christian artist, I don't know, what I would love to see is a return to just widespread respect for the liturgical arts and for the adornment and ornamentation of sacred spaces and for a sort of um, industry to reemerge there where there's sort of thoughtful, discerning consideration about how to adorn those spaces, um, how to select artists for those spaces so that there's, you know, maybe a constant demand coming from a very kind of respectable source. Um, and then artists can train for that. And I, I, I wish that existed. That is what existed in some earlier periods in history. But today it's more of a retail market and more of kind of a self-promotion market. So I would kind of probably say beware but yeah. um, and be prayerful about it and just be careful. Yeah. Speaking of like the soul crushing mm-hmm. things in modernity, what what's your view on sort of AI generated art and the effect that's going to have on people trying to, you know, uh, produce Art is that is it going to um, uh, be be something that 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 pushes people away? The the, the market, you know, um, forces that oh, I can just make art through AI, so we don't need artists, you know. Um, yeah, that's that's a really good question. I know some of my students, I, a lot of my students in class are trying. They want to make a living as artists. Um, they, you know, a lot of them realize that they won't be able to do that. It may just be something they have to do on the side. Um, and but they they do feel threatened by AI. Um, uh, many of them are very bitter toward it. Um, uh, you know, and I know there there are some high profile cases of like AI winning art competitions in certain places and things, um, as opposed to you know o- winning over living artists. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I personally don't feel particularly moved by AI art a lot of the time, and I've informally talked with some of my students about this and many of them insist that they can tell when something is AI and they don't like it. Um, And and this is something that we will continue to probe. I think we need to achieve self-awareness about this. Maybe maybe this is going to force us to gain a little bit more self-awareness about like um, the power of the image and, and what, and the power of actual human involvement in the creation of an image. And if we find AI art creepy or off-putting or soulless, can we pinpoint why? I think that could actually open up a whole new sort of realm of discourse in a certain way. Um, uh, but you know, I, I don't know. I'm hopeful actually, that people will have subjective responses to AI art that's going to be negative and they're, they're maybe not going to actually desire it that much. Um, and we're going to find for some reason that maybe we haven't been able to articulate yet that things designed by human beings simply have more soul than than stuff designed by an AI. Um, I, I think about the three categories or sort of the three criteria for beauty that we've inherited from Thomas Aquinas and through some of the neo-Thomist philosophers like Etienne Gilson as well, which are like harmony, integrity, and luminosity. Um, uh, and, and harmony and integrity refer to like good proportions and kind of um, 
equilibrious, pleasing mathematical relationships within objects and pictures. But luminosity actually refers more to a sense of being ensouled, and it's a little harder to, to pinpoint what the meaning of that exactly is. But AI art doesn't seem ensouled. It doesn't have the sort of luminosity, I suppose. I know luminosity sounds like light, but it actually means something bigger than that. Um, but yeah, AI art doesn't have that luminosity. And I think a lot of people sort of recognize that. I would also point out that, of course, AI art is just sort of recombining artworks that people actually made. You know, right. it's derivative. Yeah. And so um, AI can't actually create anything from nothing. It, it's dependent. It's dependent on things people made. And so um, we shouldn't accord it too much power, maybe. Like, I, I think we don't have to fear it so much because it's ultimately just it's ultimately very derivative. You know, so I'm hopeful that it will just be a fad that will yeah, that will maybe go yeah. away. I don't know. There's something about art, just like language, where you're communicating with somebody else, and so you you expect there to be a person behind it, and there's some That's meaning right. that you you generate when it's just like the language models. You know, that's not a person, so there's not a meaning behind it, and and there's something like you said, that's soulless about it, even though yeah. it might be uh, attractive, right? I think you're right. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating because I think we're grappling with this rise of AI. Can AI make sacred art? You know, what are we to do with – I've seen AI-generated sacred art. Um, mm -hmm. And there is something, you know, off-putting about it. And sometimes, you know, you'll see there will be six fingers and it's like, okay, yeah. does that bring a certain significance to a piece that's supposed to be spiritual? Um, again, we've been talking about the transcendence of art. And Katie, I'm curious if you're um, okay with sharing – uh, how are, if it has influenced your own spiritual life and your own spirituality? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as I told you guys at the beginning, I have been weirdly obsessed with art history from a young age. Um, I, um, uh, I am a recent convert to Catholicism and I recent by which I mean, it's been, um, three years now, I think it's been maybe three and a half actually. So not super, super recent, but, um, art did play a role in that for sure. Um, you know, actually just this past weekend, someone was asking me about my journey in that regard. And I was telling them that when I was a small child, uh, we would always pass the Catholic church in my town. And, um, I, my, I was blessed to grow up in an area actually where there are limestone quarries and where there was a relatively large population of stone carvers, um, and um, that part of the country I grew up in, which was southern Indiana, supplied stone and it supplied carving to a lot of the grand buildings elsewhere in the United States, like in New York City and Washington, D.C. And so because of that local sort of skill base and um, sort of resource base, the Catholic Church in my town it was quite a spectacular building. It was made of limestone that was beautifully carved. Um, it was kind of neo-Gothic. Um, it was really unquestionably the most spectacular building in town. It was about a block and a half from my house, and we drove by it on the way to church every Sunday. And I remember always looking out my window and kind of craning my neck at that building and thinking, those people know something I don't know, and they have something that I don't have. Like, what motivated them to create something so beautiful in honor of the God that they worship? Um, it, like, I just felt like and at the the Catholics, and you know, I, I'll tell you, my childhood church people didn't really think of Catholics as Christian, but um, it was like, um, yeah, the the God that they worship, they they have so much reverence and they have so much devotion toward their God, and they have shown that in this building. And so, I think growing up, I had a little bit of envy toward that level of reverence that I saw down the street at the Catholic church, and I felt like something was missing in my church. Um, and then uh, fast forward several years, I get into grad school at Harvard University. I've had now for many years at this point a fascination with the art forms of Catholicism and of the of earlier times in general um, and just how beautiful they were. Um, and I ended up uh, choosing a Catholic artist to write my dissertation on. Um, his name was John Lafarge, and he was an American Impressionist painter. Um, but he, yeah, so Impressionist painter, he's not making neo-Gothic cathedrals or something like that. But what I was quite struck by in his work um, was um, his reflection on his creative process and how he had such a deeply incarnational sort of respect for um, the integrity of, of created things, the way they reflected the mind of God, 
um, how how he found so much reverence in contemplating them. And he he was actually quite influenced by Thomas Aquinas um, in terms of his reverence toward and attention toward the world. And this showed up, I felt, in his artistic style. Um, and I Protestants are, are raised kind of with this sola scriptura idea. Maybe you guys have heard this, where if it's not in the Bible, it's not true. Um, you have to kind of literally go with what the Bible says and throw out sort of in interpretive structures, traditions, so on and so forth. You have to throw out all the encrustations. Um, but kind of discovering through John Lafarge, the artist I studied, his respect for the richness of nature and sort of maybe sort of the ambiguity of things and his immersion in a, immersion in a tradition that helped him interpret because words are slippery. Um and, and how that all sort of came out and sort of the, the lavishness of his art and some of the symbolism he used. I mean, kind of studying him, just it gave me a respect for the Catholic philosophical tradition. It gave me a respect for the magisterium and the necessity of having an interpretive authority and not just looking at words on a page and assuming you know exactly what they mean. Um, yeah, it gave me respect for all the earlier art that he had studied in order to inspire his kind of modern version of Impressionism. Um, so, yeah, I, that actually started a little bit of an intellectual conversion in me just from studying his art. And um, that only grew. And I, I wanted to convert to Catholicism back when I was in grad school, but I was very reluctant because um, I my family was still Protestant. I didn't want to alienate them or alarm them. Um, so, yeah, I wrestled with it for years and years and finally just gave in. So, <laughs> But I, I think that contemplation, yeah, of art, really, my dissertation and the beauty of Catholic churches just um, is what got me started on that road. Thank you for sharing. That's beautiful. Yeah. And I think just as we prepare to um, conclude this conversation with you, Katie, uh, you are, you know, I imagine so busy as, okay, your wife, mother, university professor. Um, you write some beautiful articles for Maja Center as well. You take the time for that. Can you just leave us with some final thoughts about why all of us, no matter how busy we are, it's important to find time to encounter beauty? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I I have a verse, two verses, actually. I'm scrolling down to find them so I can read them verbatim to you that I've been using a lot lately in presentations to church groups, um, even sometimes my students. It's Matthew 6, 22 and 23. Um, the eye is the lamp of the body. Jesus is saying this. Um, if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So the eye is the lamp of the body, right? And um, we today are prolific, gluttonous consumers of visual stimuli. They crowd in around us and we can't even avoid them. I, I don't know if there's been any period in history when we have had so many images just crammed into us, whether we like it or not. And we we and we carry around with us little devices that are flickering these little images at, at us as well and adds that pop up. Right. And it's kind of it's involuntary. It's just forcing itself on us. And all of those things are going into our eyes, the lamp of our body. And I think some of those things are sort of colonizing us with darkness in ways we don't even realize. Um, and I know for me during this Lenten season, I have been deliberately cutting out consumption of most media. Um, I did that last year as well, although with less success, I'm doing a better job this year. Um, and I find it so spiritually healing. Um, and so I just I would want to stress to your viewers that um, what you take in visually matters a lot. Um, Jesus said so. Um, what we put into our minds and bodies through our eyes affects us. And one great way to get equilibrium back to be more at peace with the world, to be anchored and rooted, to find ourselves, to find our place, is to make sure we're consuming good visual things, things that have goodness, truth, and beauty in them. It's really, for me, one of the most important things we can do. 
So I especially I guess we're still in this Lenten season, I would encourage viewers to go just go find something that you know is clean and pure and true and beautiful and just sit in front of it for a while and let it wash over you and let it push some of the other bad stuff out and kind of learn that as a discipline because I think that can be extremely soul healing. Yeah, that's great. That's great advice. And you see the effect it had on uh, on your life of of, of- Mm-hmm. Looking at beauty, it's a, Absolutely. It's a, you're a, a, mm-hmm. a embody what you're what you're saying there to mm-hmm. us. So many of us are visual learners, yeah, and um, we go where the images we consume take us. Right. I'm kind of one of those people, and so we have to be very intentional, right, about what we consume. That's great advice, Dr. Kriti Kesser. Thank you so much. Well, thank you both for your attention and your great questions. It was a pleasure talking with you today really a gift to speak with Dr. Katie Kresser because obviously she's this amazing art historian, so knowledgeable, that was obvious, but she's bringing with her also theological perspective, philosophical, so to see it all woven together and the complementarity between those different areas. Yeah, I would love to take a class from her. I want to take an art history class now, but one of the things, you know, you appreciate from talking to her, that art history is wrapped up in philosophy and theology, the philosophy of the time, the history of the time, what what was going on theologically. And you see all of these things coming together to understand art. You have to understand the other aspects of the human culture, which with, with which it's embedded. Um, and then it also you know tells you something. And, and it's very interdisciplinary, you know, in that Absolutely. respect. Absolutely. And again, bringing up this idea that art points to the transcendent, um, which is something that we'll speak with other guests in this season as well. But for her to introduce this, uh, really helpful. Um, but not just art points to the transcendent as well. Yeah, I, I think she made that point about you know um, the incarnation, Christ, you know, becoming a human. That uh, uh, points it, it, it changes art. You know, it sort of makes art more transcendent. These physical things that we do, you know, uh, of art and sculpture, they you know, point to something else, and um, so that it. It's not only art, but it's also from a scientific perspective, looking at the material world after, you know, the incarnation, God becoming part of this material world. So it transforms everything in the material world um, as as pointing towards and transcendent, pointing towards pointing towards God. So as a scientist, you know, looking at a, a cell, you know, it's, it's, it's pointing towards something else um, and the same the way that art is. So this transcendence she talks about in art is also there, I think, in, in science. Now I have some questions for you, Dan. Right. Turn now to the Office Hours segment of the podcast. Um, okay, so this is a question that I think is especially relevant. This year in the U.S. church, we're in the third year of what is known as the National Eucharistic Revival. Um, we're looking towards July with the National Eucharistic Congress, a lot of discussion about the Eucharist. Um, but there's a science aspect to the reality of the Eucharist as well. There are more than 150 Eucharistic miracles that have been approved by the Vatican. Those right. are just the yeah. ones who have been approved. And my understanding, I read this, um, all of them have that have been scientifically studied um, indicate the presence of the rare AB blood group type, which is also the blood that is on the Shroud of Turin. Um, what can you tell us from your perspective about Eucharistic miracles? And um, what role do you think they play in bolstering belief about his holy presence? Yeah, no, it's 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 fascinating. I think that this is a very you know these eucharistic miracles that that have been validated in terms of studying you know the blood type. But AB is a, a um, is a very rare um, blood type, and the fact that all of them show that you know the odds of that being the case, if there wasn't something real there, is is astronomically low that all of them would show that. But I think you know like these eucharistic miracles, they don't um, necessarily add something new to the faith, but what they do is all miracles are meant for us to help us see, you know, the reality, the reality of, of, of God, the reality of eternal life, the reality of what the Eucharist is. So they, it's a, it's a sign meant for us. And so, um, if that's a, a sign that helps people come into belief of the true presence, then it's doing what miracles are, are always meant to do. You know, they think of the miracles of Christ, they're always meant to bring people to belief, right? And so the miracle, these Eucharistic miracles are meant to bring people to things that uh, the church has always taught, you know, that this is the body and blood of Christ, right? Well, turning now to a different question, but, you know, also speaking to you um, as your role as a scientist, who is a practicing Catholic, how do you, Dan, uh, this was a question that was submitted to us, how do you approach scientific studies that you are morally opposed to? Yeah, um, you know, 
it, it's interesting because there's more and more of these studies that come out using, you know, that that are um, using unethical, um, you know, stem cells or uh, cell lines and so forth. Um, and you know, so one res- uh, in one respect, says, oh, I'm not going to look at that. I'm not going to touch those things. But I think it's important, you know, and I tell my students to to, to understand these studies. What are they doing to understand the science behind these? Um, studies that you might be morally opposed to so that you can better articulate what they did and understand what are other alternative ways of doing this type of research, right? So we need to know how they're, you know, know the science that, that that's there, and that doesn't mean we're condoning it. But we do need to know what's going on so that we can articulate, you know, why better why we are opposed to it and why we think there are better ways of doing science. That reminds me of St. Thomas Aquinas because his approach was always to understand the argument, you know, better than the person you're debating, to right. know it better than they do so then you can better respond to it. Yeah, and that's exactly right. right? So you know, a lot of these studies say, well, this is the only way for us to do X. So, so if you really understand what they're doing, the limitations of that, then you can better articulate, push back. Well, no, maybe we can do that using these cells or doing it in a different way. Um, and so it's important to engage with those studies without condoning them. This is more, you know, the personal question for you. Um, but Dan, is there a specific saint out there who has personally inspired your work in the field of science? Yeah, uh, it, for me, it's uh, say John Paul II. I'm a John Paul II Catholic, you know, and that his uh, his life was very instrumental in helping me deepen my faith and understand my faith. But he is, I think. Um, uh, more than almost any other a pope has been able to sort of um, speak to the beauty of the scientific vocation, right? Um, he just he does that just about anything he speaks to, but he really respects the autonomy of science as a discipline. Um, you know, and he he talks about how science is not meant to become theology, and theology is not meant to become science. But there too should be a dialogue, and how science can inform theology and help theolo- theologians do theology better, and how theology can help inform science or allow scientists to do science better. And I think that's that that uh, dynamic relationship that he sees between the two. Yet they're autonomous disciplines that both seek the truth in their own ways. I, it, it really resonates with me because he he respects what are the findings of science and how do we engage with that, right? You know, I think that he he finds the good in everything like that. He has a, a line about how you know um, you know the science can become an ideology if it's not tempered, and how theology become superstition if it's not tempered by science. So there there's there's a a need for both to be in dialogue with with each other. I think that's it's a very there's so many interesting questions when you allow that dialogue to, to come up. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us for this episode of Purposeful Lab. Make sure to go to manjacenter.com to find out more of Purposeful Lab and what we're up to. And make sure to subscribe so that you can be alerted when our episode drops next week. We'll see you then.